Hi, everybody. Um, I think everybody's in for now, but uh, folks will, I'm sure, keep filtering in as we start up for the evening. So welcome uh, back to our Birds of Newfoundland series. Um, it's really exciting to have folks out again, and I'm excited to sort of morph into a different look at things today while we talk about the habitats of Newfoundland. So my name is Jenna McDermott, for anybody who's new here. And um, on the line today, we also have Catherine Dale. Um, she'll be monitoring the chat and helping out behind the scenes a little bit as I present. And we both work for an organization called Birds Canada. Um, Birds Canada is a nonprofit organization that has offices all across the country. And our mission is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada. And so to do, to do that, um, we run a lot of different programs across the country, and a lot of them are citizen science based. And citizen scientists are basically regular people who have an interest in birds, and they uh, join our programs and collect data about birds around them um, and submit that to the program that they're interested in. And basically, it's this huge wealth of knowledge um, just from so much people energy. So over the country, we have um, over 70,000 volunteers each year that are sharing their skills and their time with, um, with us and, and sending us bird information. And it's really exciting. Um, so right now in Newfoundland, we are running two different programs. Um, the first of that is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. So we will be having a, a specific webinar on the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas coming up in a few weeks. And I can't remember the date, but maybe Catherine will put it in the chat <laughs> for anyone who's interested in joining the Atlas and learning a bit more about it. But just a brief overview right now is the intention of it is to be able to map um, where and how many of each bird species are living across the island of Newfoundland. So to do that, uh, it's, it's a citizen science project. So we have volunteers all across Newfoundland who are inputting data in, uh, about what birds they are seeing around the island into our um, database. And it results in maps like what you can see on the right there for the Wilson's warbler, where you can see all of the colored squares are where Wilson's warblers have been found in the past three field seasons. So we have just two left for the program. And um, we're excited to have anybody join us so uh, of any skill level. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out if you're interested in that or come on out to the webinar that will be coming up in the next few weeks. Our other program uh, that we're running in Newfoundland is the Nocturnal Owl Survey. And that's actually starting up really soon um, on the 1st of April. Um, and we're actually going to be having a webinar on the Nocturnal Owl Survey on Thursday of this week. Um, maybe Catherine can put a link to that as well in the chat. Um, basically, the, uh, the Nocturnal Owl Survey is really fun for uh, beginning birders as well as more uh, advanced birders as well. Um, because there's only a few species of owls in Newfoundland that you'd need to learn for that. And so basically, you drive a set route across uh, 10 kilometers on a roadway one evening between April 1st and May 15th, um, and you play a track and listen to see what owl species are calling back to you. So it's super cool, uh, fun activity. If any of you are interested in that, you can also um, come on out on Thursday to the webinar or get in touch with us. Our information's at the end of every uh, webinar. So uh, just to note that. Um, I would like to take a second here to um, acknowledge that the lands that we're running these programs are uh, are the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and so these people have been protecting and stewarding the land here since time immemorial. And through the work of our programs, we hope to assist that stewardship in protecting all the species that we share the island of Newfoundland with. Birds Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems. And we support the needs, aspirations, and rights of Indigenous peoples to care for the land. Um, if you want to check out what 
ancestral lands you're living on or work on, I would recommend this link that I have on the bottom of the slide, nativeland.ca, which is a, a pretty comprehensive place to get a start on that. I would also like to quickly thank our partners and funders who you could see on the slide here. Um, without their support, we wouldn't be able to run our programs. And also, since we are a nonprofit, we're always happy to accept donations of any amount. So if any of you on the call are interested, you can find um, information on how to donate to us also on the last slide of today's presentation as well. And now we'll get into the meat and potatoes of tonight. <laughs> So what we're going to be talking about tonight is um, habitat and the birds that live in each habitat. So we have gone through in the last several weeks, if you've been here for the rest of the series, we've gone through nearly all of the bird species that are expected to breed on the island of Newfoundland. Um, other than the species at risk, which Catherine's going to be covering next week, so definitely come out next week. Um, so tonight is going to be a little bit of a different format because First, I'll just be going through information about what is a habitat. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what can cause changes in habitat or what can degrade habitats. Um, and then I'll go through sort of these different categories of really general broad habitat categories that I have written on the slide here. And we'll, we'll go through some of the common birds, most common birds that live in each of those. So you'll have a little bit of a, a different view of um, how to identify birds. Um, I will be using pictures of males uh, for a lot of the photos here because they are um, often more easily identified because of their brighter coloration. Um, and they're often easier to see since they're out in the open usually and singing when they're on territory. And so today, if you've been, if you've been out for the last several weeks, uh, might be a bit of a refresher for practicing your identification skills because some of it or a fair bit of it is going to be uh, fun little pools just uh, just to practice and and show some of the birds. So to start with some definitions here, um, in the simplest terms, a habitat is the place that an animal, a plant or another organism makes its home for a certain part of the year. Um, so a lot of our bird species in Newfoundland are migratory and migratory species will have a specific habitat that they use during the breeding season, which is on Newfoundland, um, and then a different habitat that they have on their wintering grounds uh, where they spend the winter. And in order to make a habitat um, that a species can be successful in, it needs to have four basic things that are kind of the basic things that uh, most any organism needs to survive, and those are shelter, water, food, and also um, space, which is maybe a bit different. And having these four things will allow an individual to survive, and also in the cases of breeding birds, usually to be successful in hatching or raising their young. So when we're talking about shelter for birds, we're obviously not talking about what we are looking for in a shelter where we want walls and a ceiling uh, to keep out the elements. But shelter for a bird can be a lot of different things. It's really anything that's hiding them from weather and predators. Um, so that can range from a single tree or bush, um, a rock cliff that they live on that can keep them from, from predators that are up at the top. Um, it could be a river bank, the dense plants that are at the bottom of a forest floor, it could be the presence of fallen logs in the forest. Anything like that is providing shelter for these birds. When we're talking about birds needing water, um, they require water both to drink and also to bathe. So, but different species do need different amounts of water. So for uh, the birds that drink water, um, that would be things like sparrows, uh, birds that are eating seeds especially need to drink more water because they don't get a, a lot of water from their food. Whereas if we're talking about raptors who are eating meat, um, they're getting most of their water from food, so they're not actually drinking water specifically very often. Um, and I think birds drinking water is one of the cutest things. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but basically they just tip their bill into the water and then dip their head backwards and sort of like 
slap their bill a little bit <laughs> while they're swallowing. It's very cute. Um, and they don't necessarily need a river or a stream or a pond or any large body of water to drink from, but they also can drink uh, from small puddles, of course, or even drink the water droplets off of leaves after a rainfall or dew in the morning. Even small amounts of water like that are often enough. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, birds do need water to bathe, as I mentioned, and that's just to keep their feathers clean, and that allows the um, the good oils that they that they have on their feathers allows it to properly keep them waterproofed so that they uh, can stay dry and warm when it's wet out. <clears throat> of course, birds need access to food um, to survive, as you would expect. Um, so they'll always be found in a habitat that provides enough of the kind of food that they eat. So this, uh, depending on the species, could be seeds, could be insects, fish or other birds or animals. And then the last requirement that I mentioned um, that, re that makes a good habitat is space. And so birds do need enough space to create a territory that they can raise their young in. So their territory that they hold should have enough um, of these other shelter, water and food that I mentioned in order to um, provide for themselves and their young. So if there's not enough space in an area, for example, if they uh, live in a forest section and it's too small, or if uh, a wetland shrinks for whatever reason, um, they may not be able to live there anymore because they don't have enough space providing them with these other habitat requirements. So some of the reasons um, that a habitat can change or that uh, birds can lose habitat are shown in pictures on this slide. And a lot of them are caused by humans, but there are also some natural um, natural things that that uh, that change habitats or or cause habitat loss, I suppose. And so I'll just start at the top left here. Um, a really common human cause loss of habitat is development. <clears throat> so for example, where that house stands, or that house is being built, it used to be a continuation of that forest, uh, that little forest patch. And uh, of course, um, then they've lost the trees there and have made that space smaller. Um, so as we create more human habitat, we're often taking away animal habitat. And this can be caused by lots of different things. We're filling in wetlands for development, we're cutting forests down for farmland, um, any sort of development like that. We can also see habitat changes from natural causes. Um, if you look at the top middle picture, you can see that caterpillar on the branch and that's a spruce budworm. It's an insect uh, that Catherine was talking about in the warbler week, if you were here. And it is a naturally found insect in Newfoundland. Um, and they, they go through cycles where there will be an outbreak um, and there's currently um, an outbreak uh, being mitigated in Western Newfoundland. Um, basically, when there's an outbreak, there becomes an awful lot of spruce budworm, and they can defoliate a lot of hectares of forest. So they're eating all the needles off the trees. And once the trees um, go through a couple of years like that, then they'll end up dying. Again, this is a natural cycling of the boreal forest, um, but it does cause habitat change um, because we go from a, a forested area to either a dead forest or once all the trees fall down after that, then we have this open area instead. Um, but that open area should regenerate and uh, younger trees will come back and grow back into a forest again in several decades. Um, some other natural disturbances to forest habitat specifically are wind events um, where all the trees will fall down and the same thing happens or uh, wildfire as well. I also have pictures here. The other two pictures are um, photos after forestry or logging operations. So obviously this is when we're cutting down older mature forests to use for um, in Newfoundland, especially pulp and paper. And this of course will then take several decades to regenerate back into a forest. So we're, we're changing from a, um, we're changing from a forest habitat to another kind of open habitat here. 
Um, and then we, of course, do have other causes of habitat change that are uh, both natural and human caused, and that can be things like mining, um, climate change, we can have trail creation, so uh, recreational activities, changing habitat, and we can also um, have effects from invasive species like the moose in Newfoundland. So in the past, there's been an overabundance of moose, and that's sort of stopped natural areas from regenerating because the moose eat all of the all of the young growth on new trees coming out. Um, so you can have habitat habitat changes from all of those things. And when we're talking about a habitat change, it doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that nothing can live there anymore, but it will change the species that are present in an area. So for example, if we have these logged areas in these pictures, um, for a few years afterwards, you might have not a lot of birds in that area, but then the small shrubs will start to grow back and small trees will come in. And then you'll get um, those early successional species of birds like Lincoln Sparrow or Wilson's Warbler. Um, for mining uh, areas that have been mined, sometimes you can get bank swallow colonies moving in using the, uh, using the steep slopes that are left behind. And this is actually one of the really important reasons that we're doing a breeding bird atlas right now is because we don't have any of this data to start with in Newfoundland. So once we um, know where all of the bird species are living now on Newfoundland, we can use that data to sort of manage and mitigate any changes to habitat that are coming in the, in the years to come. Um, so that's changes from industry um, and development, all that sort of thing. So we can use the information about where birds are, especially species at risk, when we're planning for changes so that we can minimize the risks to bird species uh, based on where they are. So when we talk about bird species um, or species in general, I guess, um, they'll often be grouped into a sort of a specialist or a habitat specialist or habitat generalist. Um, so they can either live in a, one specific habitat type or they can live in more than one habitat. Habitat generalists um, are able to persist or deal with changes in their environment much better than species with a more specialized habitat requirement. And that's because if things change, they'll maybe be, still be able to live in the new habitat that was created. So for example, we have here under the generalist area, the American Robin. And so let's say this American Robin is living in a mixed forest sort of at the edge of town and the town expands and creates a new development area. The Robin will still be able to live in the town because they're quite generalist. They can, they can survive in a lot of different habitats. But then let's say on the other case, we have a red winged blackbird like this picture on the bottom left and they are living in a marsh that's close to town. And again, the town expands, the marsh gets filled in, and we put up housing or parking lots or something in that area. That red winged blackbird won't be able to live there anymore because it is a far more specialist bird. It needs to have a wetland specifically to live in. So it will have to, oops, I'm switching. Oh my goodness, everywhere. Um, it'll have to. Uh, move on to a different place or won't be able to survive in that location anymore. Um, of course, bird species aren't grouped perfectly into sort of a specialist group and a generalist group. It's kind of um, a spectrum that you that the birds can be on um, just depending on how flexible they are with the habitats that they can survive in. So I am now for the rest of today's uh, talk, we're gonna just go through some of the major habitat types in Newfoundland and what birds we can find in them. Um, but then just remember, of course, that some of the species I'm showing you can also be found in a different habitat. Um, and I'll just be really showing you some of the most common in each of the broad habitats we're talking about. So the first, um, first broad habitat I'll discuss is urban habitat. And this can look a little bit different depending on where you are, of course. There can be either more trees, less trees, vegetation and grass or no vegetation. Um, but really the, the common thing between any of these urban areas is that 
the birds there are sharing the space with humans. So bird species that are living in urban areas will often use food left around by humans. You can think of pigeons sort of pecking um, scraps of whatever they find off the sidewalk. Um, for water, they're using puddles formed on the road. They're using buildings, human buildings for their shelter as well. And it's really interesting. Um, there's been some work uh, done by um, researchers that shows that bird populations inside of cities versus outside um, are, are different in their behavior where urbanized birds will often sing louder and um, they're either bolder or braver than the birds of the same species that are out uh, in rural areas or the countryside. And um, also the amount of predators and available food is different for birds living in urban areas. And that actually causes changes for individual birds on their, the length of their breeding season and also causes birds to lay more eggs to make up for a lower survival living in the city. So this is our one of one of uh, a, a very common bird that you can expect to see in a urban area. So let's pretend you're walking along the street. You look up at the wires and you see a bunch of these birds sitting on the wires. Um, and I'm actually going to just do a little start our polls here. Um, so what is this bird? If the poll window is covering it, you should be able to drag the window to the side. <clears throat> We've got lots of people participating. That's really nice to see. So I'll just close it in five seconds. Okay. So this is a European starling as um, lots of you thought. And um, they can be found in huge groups in urban areas. Um, when they fly around together in those big whirling groups, it's called a murmuration. It's really cool to see. Um, the uh, red-winged blackbird doesn't have as much uh, different colors in it. And the common grackle is sort of the same thing. And they have a much bigger bill. Um, and the red-winged blackbird would have a red patch on the wing. Um, but the starling here, um, is a species actually from Europe, the European starling, but they do incredibly well in urban areas. Okay, here is another bird that is really common in urban areas. Um, so let's say you're walking along again uh, through St. John's and you see a small bird fly out of a little hole in some siding. Um, it lands on a windowsill and you see this bird there um, I'm going to start another poll if I can manage to. And what do you think this bird species is? I'll just close it in a couple of seconds here. Okay. So this is in fact a house sparrow. It's a male house sparrow. Females um, look a bit different because they're mostly brown all over. Um, house sparrows are another species that are incredibly um, successful living in urban areas. So they'll actually build a nest in any small cavity that they can find. Um, so that can include gaps behind loose siding, uncovered house fence. Um, on the picture that just I popped up on the slide here, um, there was a pair of house sparrows nesting inside of this electrical opening for three years when I lived at the house near there. Um, they'll really go into any small area and nest in it and they're very successful. Um, some people answered that this was a junco or song sparrow or a purple finch. Um, the house sparrow male is quite distinctive 
with uh, none of these other species have that really black black area around the face and the the gray on the on the top of the head there. Um, so they are quite a bit different than those other species. Okay, what else have we got in the urban areas? Oh, this one. I think probably most people uh, know what this bird is. So let's say you're walking along still and you see 10 of these birds sitting on top of somebody's roof. Uh, I'm not gonna have a poll for this because I think everybody knows this is a pigeon. Um, pigeons are also known as rock doves. That's their another common name for them, I guess. And um, rock doves, like their name suggests, also can breed on cliffs. And if you're in St. John's, actually, you can see some if you walk the trail from the battery that goes up to Signal Hill. There's like a, a gap in the cliff on the left hand side if you're going up. And there's a bunch of pigeons that live in there. Um, but in cities and towns, pigeons will, of course, nest on window ledges and balconies or any other flat spot that they can find that's suitable. They're also very well adapted to living in urban areas. Okie dokie. What do we got next here? Oh, here's another, another species that we can find in, in urban areas pretty commonly. This bird builds nests on overhangs above doors, um, under raised decks in the rafters or gutters of a shed. Um, and you can often see them eating berries in the winter or during the fall or picking worms off maybe the lawn in the summer. So we'll do a poll for this one as well. Um, who's this species that you can find in urban areas? Okay, I'll just leave it open for a couple more seconds for any last answers. Okay, I'll close it up. So this is in fact an American robin, as many of you said. Um, they're very common in urban areas, but they can also be found uh, out in more wild forests. Um, so the robin is definitely more of a habitat generalist than some of the others that we've seen. So for example, you wouldn't be seeing a house sparrow out in the middle of the woods. They just wouldn't live there. Um, but a robin, you could see them out there. Um, okay, the, uh, I guess I could do, uh, mention these other birds, the Northern Flicker, some of you answered. Um, it would have been sort of brown all over um, with um, just a, a mark of color on the head. And the red-breasted grosbeak has a very different looking bill because uh, they are a grosbeak, so they have a really heavy, uh, solid bill. And um, rather than uh, this thrush bill, and they are um, a bit of a different color as well with a very vibrant red on the chest. Okay, we're moving on now to coastal habitat. Um, so coastal habitat I'm using as a really broad term here um, for where the land meets the ocean. So of course we have a lot of this area in Newfoundland. Um, a main similarity between a species that you'll find in coastal areas is that they are using both the land and the ocean to provide for their needs. So the land area can be different habitats on the land, but we're talking about really this intersection between land and water or land and ocean. Um, we can expect some of our most iconic species to be found in coastal areas. So like the seabirds, they're nesting in coastal habitat on either small ledges on the steep cliffs, like you can see in the picture on the left, um, or on islands that are close to shore. Uh, that's for avoiding predators like foxes that could come, uh, they can't access them there. And then of course we have other birds like ravens, some of our raptors will nest on steep cliffs as well. And so as I mentioned, yes, they're using uh, these steep areas as 
um, safety from land predators, and they're using the ocean mostly for their foods. So they're often catching fish. Um, what else did I want to mention here? Oh yeah, so just the other, I guess, groups of birds that you'll find there. We're talking about uh, shorebirds as well that are using sort of the edge of water and land. We're talking about gulls who are breeding on uh, coastal islands, um, gulls and terns. And then of course you'll find bald eagles and osprey on the coast, coastal areas as well because they are hunting predominantly for fish. So we'll go through again a few of our most um, common species in Newfoundland that are found on the coastline. So uh, let's say you go to Cape St. Mary's Ecological Reserve, you will see a lot of this common coastline species. Um, and again, they're not only using the land they're nesting on, but also the ocean around it. So um, I'll put up a poll about what this species is. Um, this species can fly sometimes hundreds of kilometers to find good fish supplies. So they're really using the ocean um, like quite widely. And with climate change, ocean warming is having a huge effect on this bird because um, as the ocean warms, the, the fish that they're looking for are um, a cold water fish. And so they have to go deeper. So um, this bird has to dive deeper to get the, get the fish that they're looking for. And I think somebody, something popped up that somebody raised a hand just now. Uh, if you raise your hand, you can either uh, unmute yourself and ask a question, that's perfectly fine. Or type something in the chat, feel free. Okay, uh, this is what everybody had for the answer here. These are Northern Gannets. Yes, that's correct. Um, <laughs> albatrosses look super similar. That's why I put that in here, but we actually don't have any albatross that breed in Newfoundland. Um, so these are gannets, but they are also very large. Um, and <laughs> a pterodactyl, someone answered too. <laughs> and the herring gull would have had um, a very different sort of bill uh, instead of uh, this, the bill that we see on the gannet here. Okay. Here's another species um, that also nests on the ledges of steep cliffs along the coastline in huge colonies, thousands of birds together. And they are also using, um, they're also flying to the ocean to find fish. So did that, did that open just now? Looks like it didn't. Oh, okay. Sorry, these poles are always very confusing. Um, uh, what do you all think this species is? Another common coastline species. I'll just leave it open for a couple more seconds. Okay, I'll close this up. This one is a little bit harder, um, but most of you were correct. These are common MERS. And as I mentioned, they are nesting in these huge colonies along the cliff edges, um, also known as TERS. And they look really similar to the thick build MER, which a lot of you answered as well. Um, the thick build MER has a little white mustache. Um, <laughs> which is maybe difficult to see from a distance, but it is there. Um, and razor bills have a really thick bill compared to these uh, thin, the thin bill of the common mer. Um, and the great black back gull would have a white head, even though it has black all over the wings and the back. But all of the species that I put as options here are nesting um, in coastal areas, for sure. Great black back gulls, maybe not uh, on the cliff sides, uh, but the other ones are definitely all on the cliff edges. I have another species here that is also nesting on the ledges of steep cliffs along the coastline. And they're also found in really large colonies. 
Um, and again, like all of uh, the species we've talked about in coastal areas, they're flying into the ocean to catch fish as well. Um, so what do you all think this species is? This one I think is pretty tricky. I'll just leave this open a couple more seconds for a few answers to come in, a few more answers. Okay, I'll share that. Um, well done to 65% of you. Uh, this is a black-legged kittiwake and it's little chicks. Um, all of these species, again, that I offered as options here are found in coastal areas. The black-legged kittiwake is the only one that's nesting on a cliff side. The other ones are nesting on the tops of usually coastal islands. I don't know how to unmute myself. Oh, hello, I can hear you. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> um, so the uh, this is a black-legged kittiwake. You can see its little black feet, actually, if you look really carefully. Um, none of the others have black legs, um, but they do all look quite similar um, other than the, the black legs and uh, the terns don't really have quite the extent of black in the wings. And the, the two gull species have a bit of a heavier build. It's not quite as, um, quite as dainty as this kittiwake here. Okay, I think I have another species. Yeah, one more species for the coastal area. So um, I'll just open up the poll quickly for this one. Who do you think this species is? Um, we are also seeing them along the coastline. They're hunting for fish um, or ducks uh, or stealing things from other birds who are hunting for fish. Um, but they're not necessarily breeding along the coastline, but they are definitely present in that area. Um, and you can see them quite a lot on the coastline because they're using it for, for finding food. I won't leave this one open too long here. Okay, I'll close this up. So this is a bald eagle. It has a little bit of uh, darkness on its head still, so it's not quite in its complete adult plumage. So young bald eagles will actually be uh, dark brown with just a little bit of white speckled in instead of having the full white head and white tail, but this is almost an adult. Um, the other options here, uh, the ospreys definitely found in coastal areas and not quite so much the northern hairy and rough-legged hawk. They're not really using the ocean for, um, for finding food. Okie dokie. Let's move on now to our next habitat type, which is the barrens or tundra. Um, again, I'm using really broad sort of habitat types here um, as really, yeah, very broad ones. Um, so barrens and tundra can be found in definitely a few different places in Newfoundland. So we can find these areas up at the very tops of mountains where the climate is rough enough um, from wind exposure or um, being cold longer in the year to keep tall vegetation from growing. Um, so we're talking about areas with no trees or bushes, just really low plant cover, uh, little shrubs and things like that, or grasses. And it, this is usually caused by a shorter growing season or deep and late snow cover that doesn't really allow long enough for uh, larger plants to grow. And it also could be caused by, um, low nutrients in the soil or really rocky soil so that they, it can't really support much plant life um, as well as high winds, which I think I mentioned already. We can also see barrens not only on the tops of mountains, but also of course, along coastal areas, which are also windswept and uh, subjected to the really difficult climates that are coming in from the ocean. And again, in the, in the 
the coastal areas. Um, we have very little vegetation other than grasses or other short plants, although sometimes they can be really quite dense. So the birds that are living in the barrens or the tundra often rely a lot on camouflage. So they're typically browns or grays to blend in with the rock or short vegetation. So um, a lot of the groupings that we're looking at in these areas are sparrows, um, American pipits, the horned lark, northern harrier, short-eared owl, and rock ptarmigan. That's not an extensive list by any means, but those are some of the main uh, main species and groupings. Oops. Oh. Um, so this is one of the species that I just mentioned, the horned lark. Um, it's found in the uh, open tundra areas. And the male is the main picture here and the female is up on the top left. Um, um, and they're quite a distinctive looking bird, especially if you can see the male because of those face markings um, and the uh, all of the coloration on the face. And also uh, they are hopping around on the ground um, since we don't really have a lot of vegetation in this area, as I mentioned. So the female's up there on the top left. She's um, looking pretty similar to the male, but she doesn't have the distinct black as much uh, showing on the throat. And um, Catherine loves <laughs> the sound of the horned lark, so I put in the sound here, um, and I'll just let you hear that. They sound a little bit like a tinkling bell. So if you can't find them by sight, you might hear a horned lark um, out in the barrens or tundra. Um, if you find yourself in a grassy area or coastal, coastal trail that has no trees, you might also come across this species here. And I'll put up a poll for this one. It's a tricky one, I think, but uh, we'll see how everyone does. Um, yeah, so this bird is using sort of shrubby areas, hiding in the shrubs, using that camouflage coloration. Uh, to keep from being spotted by predators. <clears throat> okay, I won't leave this open too much longer since we do have a bit to get through still. I'm just looking at the time here. <laughs> so I'll close this up and share it with you. So this is a Savannah Sparrow. Well done. Um, the others uh are very similar of course that's why i put them here but they're all sparrows uh, as you can see from that that solid bill um the savannah sparrow in this picture they are found in grassy open habitats around newfoundland and they are nesting on the ground um hidden by clumps of grasses so that's where a lot of these uh barrens or tundra species are nesting so if you see a sparrow dive into cover into a place like this um you could be dealing with a savanna sparrow. I'm not gonna go through the differences between all the species for all of these or we'll run out of time really fast, but um, if you are interested, you can like look them up on a field guide or on the internet um, and take a look at what all the different ones are looking like. Okay, here's another one. So let's say we're in a barren or a tundra area, you're seeing this bird flying past in an open, grassy, sparsely vegetated habitat. It flies low over the ground. It follows every rise and fall of the earth. Um, and what do you think this bird is? I only gave you three options here. So this species is really using that open area to hunt, um, listening for the movement of small mammals as it flies overhead. Um, and then when it hears one, it'll sort of flap in one spot and dive down in to catch it. Um, they're also nesting on the ground. And they hide their nests in thick clumps of vegetation. Um, even though it's so short, um, they can hide because of this coloration that they have. 
Okay, I'll close this up in a second here. We have a lot of people answered. That's great. Okay, so this is a Northern Harrier. Uh, it's a female because she's brown. A male would be um, gray all over. And we know that it's a nor Northern Harrier instead of a short-eared owl or rough-legged hawk because it has uh, that white patch on the base of the tail. Okie dokie. So Northern Harriers are found there. We're moving on now to wetlands. So wetlands are, um, we have a lot of different types of wetlands, but the boreal forest has the largest concentration of wetlands on the earth, which is pretty incredible. Um, we do have several different types of wetlands, but the main feature of all of them is that they are waterlogged in a way that there is water standing on top of the ground, but it's less than two meters high. Um, so the top picture is a picture of a marsh, and that's what a lot of people think about when you say wetlands, but we do have a relatively small number of marshes on the island compared to other wetland types. Um, marshes do have shallow water, of course, and they have vegetation or plants growing up through the water, like bulrushes or cattails. Um, a more common type of wetland in Newfoundland is a bog. So that's like the picture on the bottom here. Bogs are made up mostly of sphagnum moss. Um, and you can see some moss in the bottom of this picture here. It absorbs a huge amount of water and it makes the environment really acidic. And because the environment is so acidic, that means that not a lot of different plants can live there. But you do see species, of course, like a pitcher plant in this picture here, Newfoundland's provincial flower, um, bake apple or cloudberry, cranberries, Labrador tea, tamarack larch, and black spruce growing in bogs. Um, and bogs can range from having no vegetation other than the mosses and uh, smaller plants or some grasses, or some do have stunted trees or shrubs. And bogs are a really important ecosystem to protect for climating, uh, combating climate change because they store huge amounts of carbon in them. And um, we also in Newfoundland have swamps. So when you're in one, you'll know because you'll think you're in sort of a stunted forest, but you're constantly going to be getting your feet wet. There is always going to be puddles everywhere. The ground sinks or is completely saturated with water. So that would be a swamp. And then the last wetland type that I'll mention is um, open water. And that could look a lot like a pond, but it'll be really shallow or have plants growing like water lilies coming up from the bottom. And uh, open water is a popular place for ducks to breed. So um, in a follow-up email for this week, I'll send a link to um, a wetlands page that's made by Ducks Unlimited. And it has a um, even more information on different types of wetlands if you want to read about some more of that. <clears throat> so birds living in wetlands are really using the area. They're finding shelter in any of the plants that are growing there. Um, they're hiding between grasses or tight branches, and they're typically eating insects um, that they're finding on the ground or on vegetation. So some of the groupings are, of course, ducks, shorebirds, warblers, uh, certain species of warblers, certain species of sparrows. A lot of blackbirds are associated with water um, and wetlands and also swallows. So um, the picture behind the bird here is um, a marsh because it has these cattails growing up from it. And the species that you can see here um, that we have in Newfoundland is only found in marshes specifically. And they build their nests attached to cattail stalks. Um, and so they suspend their nest attached to the stalk up in the air uh, between two or more stalks. And you don't often see the females because they're um, mostly brown and they're very good at hiding. But the males, like uh, the picture you see here, will perch up on the top of the plants and sing really loudly and be quite conspicuous. Um, and I see we're getting quite a lot of answers coming in, which is really nice. And so I'll close this in a second and tell you what it is. Mm. 
Okay, I'll close this up now. Um, so 97% of you said it was a red winged blackbird, and that is correct. And uh, we know that because um, of the full black plumage with that big red patch on the wing, uh, which is only found on the red winged blackbird here. So they are found in not a lot of places in Newfoundland, but they're always associated with marshes. Let's move along to this, uh, this other type of wetland. This is a bog again. So you can see in this picture, we have some small shrubs on the left, sort of middle area. Farther in the distance, we have a larger patch of kind of stunted trees. The whole ground is really wet and squishy. Um, and let's say you see a bird like this sitting on top of a tall tree or one of the snags, uh, dead trees that are there. Um, and it starts calling incessantly at you. Um, it might even get really upset and start diving, dive bombing at you as you walk through the bog or go through the bog. And it might just keep doing that even if you move on to a whole new area. Um, let's see what this species is. Um, this species also actually nests on the ground, but they are very territorial, as I was just saying. So they'll lure you away from their nest by calling from a completely different location. So you might think they're uh, trying to call you from near their nest, but they're actually trying to lure you away. I'll close this up now. And this is a greater yellow legs. Um, the other species there are, don't have those big old long yellow legs. Uh, so that's a, a good name for them and a good marker to look at uh, for the greater yellow legs for sure. Okay, let's move along to this other little bird that you can find. Um, you might notice this flash of yellow in the little scrubby bushes that are close to us in the picture in the bog. And when you get a look, good look at it, it's this little bird here. Oops, doing things all wrong in the pole again. Um, so what do you think this species is? This bird is found really in any wet area that has low dense bushes or other vegetation. They're often very hard to spot because they're really quite sneaky. Um, they're hiding definitely among the leaves and the branches, um, but they're always associated with wet, uh, wet areas. I'm really throwing everything at you today, <laughs> all the different kinds of birds. I'll close this up now and share it. So this is a common yellow throat. Um, well done to you folks who got that. Um, the other options that I gave you were quite similar because they all have yellow on them as well. Um, but we have this warbler bill here, so that eliminates the goldfinch. Um, and Wilson's warbler has a black cap and a yellow warbler um, doesn't have any color but yellow on it, except for some streaking of orange. So this is a common yellow throat. Um, They're associated with wetlands. Here's another bird. Um, so let's say you're walking through the bog. You might hear some insistent chipping. Um, you just keep hearing a bird chipping away. You can't see what it is. It basically seems like it's moving around on the ground under the low vegetation and eventually it pops up and you see this beautiful bird. Um, who do you think this one is? I will say that all of the species that I've given as options can be found in um, wetland areas, actually. I'm going to close this down and share it. So this is a Lincoln Sparrow. That was a tricky one. Um, even though we get a good shot of it here, they are very hard to spot sometimes in the wild because they're often hiding under dense shrubs or plants. Um, we're looking for on the Lincoln Sparrow, these really fine streaking 
Um, it's really blending in with the branches. The Swamp Sparrow would have a really uh, rusty, bright rusty brown color all along the top of the head and the back, uh, whereas this, this bird is a bit more gray. Okie dokie. This is a different sort of bird. <laughs> um, when we are looking at this bird here, uh, it's going to be nesting in shallow marshes or small ponds that have forested edges. Um, but again, a wetland bird for sure, as well as all of the other species that I've given as options here. Okay, I'm going to close this up here. Um, this is a ring-necked duck. Um, I think it's a terrible name for this duck because you cannot usually see any ring on the neck, but I think it should be called a ring-billed duck. Um, but all of the ducks, of course, are present in different wetland types. And so if you weren't at the duck webinar that we had, you can uh, pop back to the recording of that presentation uh, to look at what all the different ducks are. Okay, I seem to be going really slowly today. We're almost at eight o'clock, so I apologize because we still have quite a bit to go through. Um, and feel free to leave at any point if you need to, and we will send a, a recording to you all, of course. But I will say I still have quite a bit to get through, so I apologize for that. Um, our next habitat type is coniferous forest. So you can find coniferous forest, of course, across the entire island of Newfoundland. Basically, these are forests with coniferous trees. So those are evergreen trees. They're mostly black spruce and balsam fir in Newfoundland with uh, pines in certain areas of the island. And the forests can vary in what they look like depending on how old they are. So for example, the picture on the far right is a younger balsam fir forest. It's coming back after logging. And so it's really dense with young fir trees that are incredibly close together and they're quite short. Um, so that coniferous forest could have slightly different species using it than an old growth forest like the one that you see in the middle here. An old growth forest has larger gaps between the trees. Um, and because of that, smaller plants can grow up between them because the sunlight comes through. Um, and this provides multiple layers of cover for birds to use for protection from predators. We can also see differences in the bird species that use Coniferous forest based on the elevation, if it's uh, low elevation or high elevation. So when we're talking about uh, different birds that live in the coniferous forest, we're thinking of thrushes, um, certain species of sparrows, certain species of warblers. We have um, grouse, some owls. The finches are often in coniferous forest because they're eating seeds, as well as woodpeckers. So for example, uh, this bird here is more likely found um, near to uh, the higher areas of mountains. They can actually be really hard to hear for people who have older ears or ha have hearing damage. And um, they are foraging for insects among tree branches with their little needle-like bill. Okay, I'll close this one up here. So this is um, actually a black pool warbler. Um, this was tricky because black, it's obviously fully black and white, but uh, black and white warbler has stripes on its head, uh, black and white stripes as well. So this is a black and white warbler, but all of these birds that I offered here um, can be found in coniferous forests as well. Okay, I have uh, some other species here. So these birds are found in basically any coniferous forest, um, but they do especially like lower or scrubbier trees. And they'll sing the morning and night and all through any weather. Uh, they're really hardy bird and probably a lot of you have heard them even if you've never seen them. Um, we're getting some answers coming in here. This is good. I'll leave it open for just another second. 
Okie dokie. So this is a white-throated sparrow and um, white-throated sparrows can be found in coniferous forests. The other ones are a little bit more in open habitats actually. So um, although they may look similar, they're not necessarily found in the same habitat as white-throated sparrow. Okay, so here we have in this picture a little bit of an older spruce forest where the trees are taller um, and they're full of cones. And so a flock of birds that looks like this might fly by um, and land in the trees. And they're all going to start foraging on it and eating seeds out of that tree. All of the species that I've written as options here can be found in coniferous forests because they're all seed eaters. Um, so you can look out for any of them. Okay, I'll close this up in a second here. And this is a white-winged crossbill. This was a tricky one that uh, the males of all of these species are sort of this reddish pink color, but the white-winged crossbill is the only one that has that crossed bill if you look at their beak and also has white sections on the wings. But all of these, uh, all of these birds are finches and they're all found in coniferous forest. So here we have um, another coniferous forest again. It's pretty thick on the on the edges there. It'd be hard to pop in there if you're trying to bushwhack. Um, there's not really holes in the canopy other than on this path to let the light in when you're not uh, on that path. And you hear a beautiful flute-like sound drifting out and then you catch a glimpse of this bird here. Um, what do you all think that bird is? This species, lives in mixed forest uh, as well as coniferous forest. And they are often found hopping around on the ground, foraging for insects under the leaves or on other items on the ground. And that's true for all of the species actually that are here. And all of the species that are options are found in coniferous forest. So I'll close this in a second. Tricky one. This is a tricky one. This is a hermit thrush, and we know that um, because it has those long thrush legs and that thrush bill, so it's not a sparrow, and it has a red tail compared to the color of the rest of its body, whereas the other uh, thrushes don't have that uh, contrast. Okay, we'll move on to our next habitat type, which is deciduous or mixed forest. And we do have um, forests throughout Newfoundland that are composed of deciduous trees. So that's things like birches, the trees that are losing their leaves in the winter. And we can also get forests that are a mix of both deciduous and coniferous trees. And that's somewhat more common in Newfoundland than just having a, a deciduous stand. So both of the pictures here are actually mixed forest. And like in coniferous forest, mixed forest, uh, or deciduous forests can look different depending on how old they are. And the leaves of deciduous trees are really perfect for birds to hide behind, especially when we're talking about small warblers. Um, and they're also often attracting a lot of moths and caterpillars, so that provides great food for birds and their young. And some bird species actually collect caterpillar silk um, to weave into their nests, which is super cool. Um, when we're thinking about birch trees, uh, the peeling bark can also contain a lot of insects that are hiding behind those little nooks and crannies, and that can be really good food uh, for birds looking for insects. So when we are talking about deciduous or mixed forests, we have again thrushes. Uh, you'll Some of these groupings, of course, are found in a lot of different habitat types because we have multiple species in each one. So we have different thrushes or sparrows some warblers, we have a grouse species, um, woodpeckers will use these, vireos, as well as waxwings because waxwings are really um, looking for fruit. So in mature mixed forests with adult trees, 
and other plants along the forest floor. You might hear this bird um, singing at the tippy top of the tree. Um, often can be really hard to get a look at, uh, but if you do, it's quite distinctive. There's not quite a lot of other birds that look, that look very similar to it in Newfoundland. Um, this species makes really cool hanging nests, hanging cup nests. They attach the rims of the nest in a V to a couple of branches um, and they weave a nest together from grasses, pieces of bark, and actually use spider webs to stick things together um, and hold it all together. So I'll just close this one up now. This is a blue-headed vireo. Um, and it's really uh, quite distinctive with that white spectacle and the little hooked bill. But um, yes, the other species that I've listed can also be found in mixed forests, but the olive slide of flycatcher is, is much more common in coniferous forest. Um, you could be walking along that path that I showed in a, a few pictures ago, and suddenly you hear a huge commotion bursting from uh, beside you in the woods. And once you calm your beating heart and look around, you might see this bird walking along the ground or perching super awkwardly on a branch. So we'll close this up in a second if any other answers want to come in. Okay, so um, yes, this is a ruffed grouse. Um, the ruffed grouse is definitely more common in deciduous woods compared to the spruce grouse, which is, which is more often found in coniferous forest. Um, and they also do look a bit different because the uh, rough grouse has that brown, um, sorry, the spruce grouse has a brown, a, a sort of a rusty brown tip at the bottom of the tail, whereas um, the rough grouse uh, has this uh, dark brown bar along the bottom of the tail bordered by a pale section. Um, but yes, habitat is really good mark for uh, figuring out which species of grouse you're looking at. I have another bird here. Um, it's often found sort of at the edges of mixed or deciduous forests um, or along stream banks. They're always flitting around, they're really active and they will fan their tails out um, and their wings sometimes. So you can see the color on their tail really easily. Um, so it's a really good mark for figuring out what this species is. But as you can see here, I have a whole bunch of uh, warbler species and um, not all of them are necessarily as common in the deciduous forest. So I'll close this one up here. Um, this one is a American red start. Um, they're really, very distinct with the, uh, I like to call them a sort of a Halloween bird, this black and orange, the males. Um, the black pool warbler that I put in this list is mostly um, only found in coniferous forest. So uh, again, it's um, if you're confused about a species or, or just have a few options that you're looking at, um, reading your field guide uh, or your electronic field guide, what habitat they live in, you'll be able to eliminate some species as well. I think this must be, yes it is, my final habitat type. I'm really sorry that I'm very slow today, everyone. Um, this is the deciduous shrubs. I made it as a separate um, habitat because um, it's sort of all over Newfoundland, um, along old logging roads, old logging roads or ATV trails, um, along transmission lines on the trailway, um, or even sort of naturally found along the edges of forest 
especially where we're turning from forest to a wet zone or early regeneration. So these are um, alders. They're the ones that are growing in along and like brushing alongside of your car or your ATV as you're driving through. Um, alders are usually pretty short, only a little bit taller than a person, very dense. And the stems, in my opinion, are kind of like a big octopus that are just trying to trip you with all of their arms if you ever have to find your mate, uh, make your way through them. Um, but alders or these decidu deciduous shrubs can be really packed with little birds. And they're often quite colorful, um, bright yellow sometimes, but they're really good at hiding in the dense foliage. And that's what makes um, this a good habitat for them uh, for the shelter part because they can hide so well in the dense bushes. So we do have a lot of species of warblers that are using alders. Um, some of the sparrows, flycatchers, and gray catbird, which is uh, one specific species that can be found in alders. So I think I maybe have three birds here at the end. Um, this is by far one of the most numerous birds that you'll see or hear in alder patches. Um, it's bright yellow, as you can see. It's really an exuberant singer, um, can sing pretty consistently. And you can often get a pretty good look at the males when they're singing uh, because they'll stand out um, singing so loudly amongst the, amongst the bushes there. Um, I'll say that all of the options that I've given you here can be found in this habitat type in the in the deciduous shrub or the alders. Um, and they're all <laughs> lots of small yellow birds. So I'll just close this up and uh, most of you got this correct. It is a yellow warbler, um, fully yellow bird, except for these sort of chestnut streaks on the breast of the male. But they're incredibly common. One of the a great species to learn, especially when you're just getting started. So here's another common bird that's uh, in alders or especially sort of wetter uh, deciduous shrubs that are just growing back maybe after a disturbance. Um, looks a little bit different than the last bird we had. But they are often pretty tricky to see, especially to get such a clear view as this because they really skulk around in the bushes, uh, but they are quite a loud singer. Um, so maybe one to listen to their song of another day. We're getting a mixed bag of answers coming in here, I have to say because this is hard. <laughs> um, I'll close this up here and share. So this is a morning warbler. Um, this is a male, and so he has a gray hood and that black chest patch, and he's yellow otherwise. Um, a blue-headed vireo is actually going to be found in the tippy tops of um, mature trees. So a blue-headed vireo wouldn't be found in a deciduous shrub. Um, and same with a black-throated green warbler, actually. They are also found sort of at the tops of trees um, that are quite mature. But the Wilson's warbler and the morning warbler are definitely found in alders. And I think this is the last, the last one that I have for, um, tonight. So this is another common uh, little yellow bird <laughs> that's found in alders a lot, um, especially in drier areas or regenerating areas. Um, this one's collected an awful lot of food for its babies, that's for sure. All of the options that I've given you here are can be found in alders, um, all of these warbler species. And I'll close this up in a second to tell you who it is. Okay. So this is a Wilson's warbler, and you can tell that because although the others are also mostly yellow, uh, the Wilson's warbler is the only one with that little black cap on his head. Um, 
So that's the Wilson's warbler. But again, all of these warbler species that I offered as options are found in uh, alders or deciduous shrubs. Okay. We've made it to the end, <laughs> 15 minutes late. <laughs> so thank you for everyone who stuck around for that. Um, that's all the habitats I'll go through for today. There is of course some overlap or nuances between the habitats. Um, it's not so cut and dry necessarily, but we have gone through some of the most common species that you'll find in a habitat type. Um, the key point I think from tonight to take away is that if you need help identifying a bird and you have a few different options, definitely make sure that you're looking at the field guide or um, a habitat description because you'll be able to eliminate some species based on uh, what habitat you're in. Um, and of course, as you get more comfortable with birding and with more practice, you'll get a better idea of what you should expect in an area that you find yourself in to uh, know to start with what you might be looking for. So thank you again, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, if there are questions, Catherine, maybe we can help out or we can uh, figure out how to answer those. And if anyone's uh, interested in getting involved with the Atlas or the OWL survey, we do have those webinars coming up in the next few weeks uh, that you're more than welcome to join us at. So thank you very much, everyone. Okay, excellent presentation as always, Jenna. Thank you very much. People really liked having the bird polls uh, interspersed throughout, so <laughs> that was a plus. Um, so I think I'm not seeing any questions coming in. I'm I'm having a look, but there was. Um, if you go back to the coniferous forest section, one of your poll questions. I'm afraid I had actually stepped away. Uh, so the question was, did you have a black pole or um, a black and white warbler there? And I don't know because I didn't see it. So maybe you can help us yep. out. I had a black pole warbler and I wonder if we can find it. There oh, we there are. There, there he is with his little black head. Yep. So, so yeah. they're tricky, but yeah, black and white warbler would have black and white stripes on top. So this is a black pole. Excellent. Yeah. Black pole, pole meaning head, little black head. Yeah. And okay. also those those orange legs are pretty a good mark for the black pool warbler as well. Uh, all right. And uh, you're welcome, Ellie. And uh, Grant, you're asking how you can join the OWL webinar and the other one. Uh, so you just have to register for each one separately. Um, so you can find the link to register uh, for the OWL webinar, which is on um, Thursday. Thursday. I put it in the chat earlier um and sorry now there's a bunch coming in all at once so i'm trying to keep up <laughs> um yeah so i put it in the chat earlier i'll put it in the chat again we'll also include it in what we send out um as a, as a follow-up email and it will be available on our facebook and on our website tomorrow so you'll have lots of different ways to sign up for the owl webinar uh, links to sign up for all of the other webinars are currently available on our website if you go to upcoming events and also you can find them on Facebook. Um, Rennie, you are correct that black pole warblers have among the longest migrations in North American mm -hmm. birds and part of the reason that we've learned that is through um, a tracking system called MODIS which Birds Canada helps to run so it uh, you attach little radio transmitters to the birds and then we have towers throughout North and South America and that actually uh, picks up the signals that the, the tags on the birds emit. Um, so I did answer your question about agriculture, um, what, what habitat would farm agricultural land be? It's really kind of its own habitat. I mean, it's, it's kind of open grassland, but it is kind of its own <laughs> habitat really. We just don't have much of it here in Newfoundland. Yes, true. Other than a little bit up down in Codroy and a few other areas scattered around, for sure. Oh, and Matt, I see that you've put the uh, the link to the OWL registration in for me, so that is fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and yes, our black poles are extremely uh, difficult to identify in the fall. They change plumage. They're, they're a pretty extreme example of plumage change, so uh, I completely agree. They are very tricky. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I think birds I in breeding plumage there? is easiest for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Males in breeding plumage. Males in breeding plumage are the ideal place to start. <laughs> um, okay, I think I, all of those came in at once, but I think I got them all. 
<laughs> uh, if I missed anybody's question, just put it in there again, uh, and I will I will read it out. But otherwise, thank you all for joining us tonight. And Jenna, thank you for doing a great job as always. Thanks everyone for sticking around to the end here. <laughs> Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>